God bless you and good evening. Welcome to the Spring Hill broadcast. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Welcome to the Spring Hill broadcast. Thank you so much for joining us. If you're joining us from somewhere around the Gainesville region, outside the Gainesville region, somewhere else in the state of Florida, somewhere else around the United States, or somewhere else around the globe, we have prayed for, planned for, and prepared for the opportunity for us to share together in the Word of God, and we're praising God for the chance that we have to study His Word together. Do us a favor, if you will, put a thumbs up uh, in whatever platform you're joining us from, and like and subscribe if you're joining us from our YouTube page, and also if you're joining us from our Spring Hill website. If you're joining on the website proper, then put a comment in on whatever platform you're on, and type in praise the Lord, type in praise the Lord, and let us know that you're here, present, and, to, and accounted for. And if you're joining us from somewhere outside of the uh, state of Florida, hey, let us know where you're joining from. Uh, and we thank God for your presence. Uh, the Word of God in Psalm number 150 says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with the stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the house high sounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you, God, for just taking care of us throughout this day and watching over us. We pray, our Father, that you would forgive us of our sins, take away our faults, failures, failures, and unrighteousness, and create within us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. We pray, God, that you would touch our friends, our loved ones that need your power, that need your grace. Please have mercy upon us all. And as we prepare to open the word, open our minds that we may understand, soften our hearts that the word would sink in deep and strengthen and fortify our faith that we can live out the word of God. We pray if someone is not saved, save that person tonight by the power of grace divine that they may fall on their knees this evening and ask the Lord Jesus to come into their heart and save them. We pray for those that have strayed away from the faith. Please draw them back uh, nearer to you. Straighten us out, Heavenly Father, and for us all, strengthen us according to your will and according to your word. These are your servants' prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless and thank you so much for joining us. I, I want to uh, begin a series of uh, messages uh, about uh, how to share our faith. So we're often talking about um, having gospel conversations and we're often talking about praying for uh, people to be saved and to be baptized. But in order for that to happen, uh, we need to know how to share our faith and uh, we need to become passionate about people uh, coming unto believers baptism. And so what I want to do over the next several weeks is to equip us all with the tools needed so that we feel not only comfortable, but confident in sharing our faith when the opportunities are presented so that we will see more people come unto uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, come unto the Lord Jesus Christ, be saved and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I wanna start out by walking through a teaching through this book, called Tell Someone. This book uh, by Greg Laurie titled Tell Someone. It's a great book that uh, you can find on lifeway.com. Uh, we'll put a link uh, to it either in the chat or in the, uh, in the description of the video, but it's a good, good short book, short read uh, that is titled Tell Someone You Can Share the good news. And so for the next uh, couple of weeks, I want to walk you through this and I want to encourage you that you can share the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ um, and do it to the point that it is effective and effectual that someone else will come to know the Lord Jesus as their personal savior. Uh, in the book, uh, he starts off talking about uh, his life. Dr. Lori uh, starts off uh, talking about his life and and uh, the things that happened in the early part of his life. Interestingly, interestingly, he said that he came into the world by accident, that after a night of partying and drinking uh, and drugs, his mother had a one night stand and he, nine months later, was born. 
throughout his childhood. Uh, his mom went from relationship to relationship, uh, ultimately marrying seven different uh, husbands and having several boyfriends in between, all of whom were uh, toxic, or most of whom were toxic and just unhealthy relationships. Uh, but she encountered one man that um, showed him what a real father was, and she married that man, and that's the name of the man uh, for whom he is, uh, has his last name, because that husband actually uh, formally adopted him. He was an attorney and in New Jersey, and he formally adopted uh, the boy who was not his. But uh, for whatever reason, his mom takes him, picks him up after school, snatches him away, moves to Hawaii, and uh, in that space, he loses the only real father that he's ever known and who ever really loved him genuinely and, and the way a father should love. And so he's traumatized and hurt by that. He moves to Hawaii and his mom is in another toxic relationship where she's physically and verbally abused and he sees all of this. And so he grows up to be a teenager that is cynical, angry, and mad at the world because he's seen nothing but bad, horrible things for most of his life. And so he grows up in this context, but God, in his own providential way, allowed this boy to go to a high school where he meets a young Christian that's doing Bible study. In high school, there's a girl there that is walking around and she loves God and lets it be known and while she and a group of kids are sitting out on the grass uh, during lunchtime talking about God, this boy is sitting close enough uh, that he overhears what they're talking about. And it does something to him to see their joy, to see the love that they have for people and for each other, but then to hear them talk about this God that he has only ever known uh, while he uh, uh, visits his grandparents sometimes during the summer and sometimes during holidays. <coughs> Excuse me. And he's exposed to, to Christ. He's exposed to God, but, but not much. But during this youth Bible study, he receives the Lord Jesus Christ and he becomes a follower uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this girl exhibits what every follower of Jesus should be engaged in on a regular basis, and that is sharing our faith leading others to Christ, discipling others, and helping them to be grounded in the Lord's work and going out and doing, a, doing it again. She exhibits the purpose of the Christian life. Let me say it again. That is every follower of Jesus should be engaged in a, on a regular basis in sharing our faith, leading others to Christ, and discipling them and helping them to get grounded in the Lord's church and then going out and doing that same thing again. This boy's life is changed, it's transformed. It's a horrible start, but it's transformed by the power of the gospel. And friend, let me share this with you that that's what I'm laser focused on. In this season of my life, I am laser focused on sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul said in Romans chapter one, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first, but then also to the Greek. No matter all of the things that people think pastors, preachers, and teachers should be engaged in, no matter all of the things that people say the church should be engaged in, our number one responsibility and our cardinal calling is to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that people's hearts can be changed through the power of the gospel. There's no social program. There is no uh, initiative of man. There is no uh, activity. There is no event that's going to uh, supersede the power of the gospel. And in this man's life, Dr. Laurie, or, or uh, the writer of the, of the book that we're using, um, he comes to faith, and I want you to get this, by the divine providence of God. God's hand was at work moving in this man's life. And friend, let me share this with you. 
that just as God was working and moving in mysterious ways through the ups and downs of this boy's life, through the, the brief moments that he went to church with his grandparents, during that brief time in his life where he met uh, his man that he called uh, for a lifetime, his dad, uh, even though they were separated and later on, sometimes uh, some years later, they were able to reconnect. Through all of that, God was at work. Can I share with you that God is at work in the life of that person that you see, meet, share with every day who doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ, that God is moving in his own unique way. In your own life, if you are saved, it was because of the providence and because of the planning of God. Maybe your life wasn't as bad and as traumatic as, as Lori's life was, uh, as you were growing up, maybe you grew up in a Christian home where things were calm and stable and where you went to church consistently. And so you don't have a defining moment like he has of, of overhearing a, a youth Bible study and, and accepting and receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe your uh, conversion experience was, was much more gradual. Maybe there was a much more gradual on-ramp that as time went on and as you became more exposed to the gospel and went to church more, that you just settled into and, and cruised into belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, that your heart uh, was just tuned to the gospel. And just uh, one day you realized that, yes, Jesus is my choice. And you made a public profession of what had grown naturally as your inward confession. And you went to believers baptism and your life has been a, a part of the Lord's church most of your life. That's my story. But friend, no matter if it's from a a catastrophic issue or some some great momentous occasion or whether it was a gradual uh, belief in the Lord Jesus Christ where you just came to the to the realization of who he was. Understand in both scenarios, it's God at work. It's God moving in his own unique way. God's plan and God's design is that people would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and to be saved. And God wants to use you and God wants to use me in order to accomplish his will. Uh, William Cooper, uh, the man who wrote The Lord Moves in Mysterious Ways, he wrote it out of a, uh, several experiences in his own life where he saw God at work. William Cooper lived in London and uh, one day uh, he was so depressed he wanted to commit suicide. He calls for a, and uh, he goes out on the street and, and he hails a carriage and the carriage comes, that was the taxi of their day, comes and picks him up and he says, take me uh, to a bridge, take me to a bridge. And as the carriage is meandering through the streets, they are unable to find a bridge. He wants to get to a bridge so he can jump off and commit suicide. They can't find the bridge because suddenly fog fell in the city that was so dense and so thick, you could hardly see in front of your face. And so the carriage uh, driver says, look, I can't go any further. I can't see. Cooper gets out and goes back into uh, his home and, and uh, is still somber. He's still depressed. A couple of days later, he decides that he wants to, he, he decides he still wants to harm himself. He, he gets a knife and decides he's going to fall on it and impale himself to death. Well, he gets the knife, he, he, he falls on it, but the blade is so uh, worn and rusted that it simply broke when it uh, touched, uh, when, when it, the weight of his chest and body fell on the knife so that he still couldn't do it. He tried several other times to commit suicide, still couldn't do it. And finally, he gets on his knees and he prays to the Lord Jesus that he would be saved and that God would rescue him from the life that he was living. And he was saved. He gets up and, and becomes one of uh, uh, the most prolific uh, hymn writers of his time. And he wrote the words to that hymn, the Lord moves in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps out on the sea and he rides upon the storm. Friend, God is moving in the lives of our friends, our loved ones. He's moved in our lives in mysterious ways in order that he may accomplish his will. Uh, the next thing I want to want to show you comes out of chapter one, and that is um, the chapter is titled Something Christians and Non-Christians Have in Common. Something Christians and Non-Christians Have in Common. There's one thing 
Lori says that believers and non-believers have in common, and that is they are both uptight about sharing the faith. We're both uptight about sharing the faith. We're, we're, we're both apprehensive uh, on the believer's end. We're apprehensive about sharing it. And on the non-believer's end, they're apprehensive and scared about receiving it. But we all need the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, in Matthew chapter 28, uh, verses 19 and 20, Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, uh, when, you, when you go there, turn in your word of God there, we love the Lord Jesus and we love his word. Look in his word, Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all of the commands that I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. God says, Christ says, he gives a commission. It's Matthew uh, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20 is what we call the great commission. It is our command to do missions. It or is our calling and ours are, it is our commitment to do missions. In Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20, he says, he says and gives us the charge that we should go into all the nations. And so it's our responsibility and so if it's our responsibility, if it's our assignment, if it's our mission to do it, what is it called when we don't do that? It's called sin. Anytime we don't do what God tells us to do, it's called sin. It, it is a sin to not share our faith. James chapter 4, verse 17, look at what, what James 4, 17 says. Uh, For the one who knows to do but does not do it, it is Sin, that's James 4, 17. Not sharing our faith is what we call the sin of omission. There are some sins of commission. That's the things that we actively do that are wrong. But then there are sins of, of omission, the things that we should do that we don't do. Those are sins of omission. Either way, it's still rebellion against God and it's still us not doing what God told us to do or doing the opposite of what God told us to do. And that's rebellion against God. And rebellion against God is sin. God wants uh, to use you to show himself strong. He wants to use your experiences. He wants to use your life in order that others may see how wonderful, how awesome and how amazing he is. God will give us what we need if we would, but simply do what he's called us to do. We can't have joy when we're living in sin, but when we do what God tells us to do, it brings us joy. In Psalm 126, verse uh, number six, Psalm 26, verse six, the Bible says there is joy in heaven over every sinner who comes to repentance. Uh, God uh, gives us joy. In Psalm 126, we, we find that God gives us joy. Well, what, where does the joy come from? It comes from seeing people come to know Christ. Joy is made complete when we share our faith. Our joy is made better when we talk to others about the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what John says in 1 John chapter 1, verse number 4. He says, we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. In that passage, he talks about Jesus and his experience with Jesus and the fact that uh, Christ is the light that lights every man that comes into the world. This then we share unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And he goes on to share the fact uh, that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and do not the truth. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John is sharing all of this and it brings him joy. And he says our joy is complete when we share it with other people. Do you want to have more joy in your Christian faith and in your Christian walk? Share your faith with others. Uh, the next thing uh, that Lori points out is that it's not just sin to not share, but we also have to confront our excuses. And a lot of us have excuses for everything, including why we don't share our faith. Many of us say, well, I can't share my faith because um, I'm just not that good of a person or I'm just not that great of a Christian or I got too many issues myself. 
Well, friend, it doesn't matter how bad you think you are. If you are indeed saved, if you really have been touched by the power and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, then guess what? God has blessed you with the opportunity to share his gospel with others. And it's not about how good you are. It's about how good the Christ is whom we share with others. Paul said it like this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. Now we have this treasure in clay jars so that this extraordinary power may be from God and not from us. God doesn't need you to be perfect. He needs you to be willing. He doesn't need you to be perfect. He doesn't need me to be perfect. He needs us to be willing vessels that will share and communicate the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only person that has ever or will ever live on this side of glory, in this space and in this place, a perfect life uh, until, the, until he comes again. And so none of us are perfect, but God doesn't need you to be perfect in order for you to talk to your brother, in order for you to talk to your sister, in order for you to share with your neighbor, hey, I love Jesus, I love the Lord Jesus, and I wanna share with you why I love the Lord Jesus. We have a treasure in earthen vessels. Do you realize that if you have salvation and if you have the word of God, you have the answer for every problem that man will ever face in this life? Jesus is the word, is the answer and his word is the answer for the world today. And the reason the world is struggling so hard is because those of us that have the treasure we put a top on the jar and we put it on the shelf and we hide it away. And friend, Jesus says, we are the light of the world, a city that sits on the hill that cannot be hid. So we should share the gospel uh, and don't hoard what God has given to us. We can't just come to church and get all of this word. We can't just be online and get all this teaching. We can't just get all of the uh, the the fellowship that we get, discipleship that we get, all of the prayers, all of the teaching, and we get it, we get it, we get it, and we just put it in a, in a bag and just stuff it away. What are you going to do with all this teaching? What are you going to do? You, you're listening tonight, but what are you going to do with it? You listen on Sunday mornings. We get handouts and all of that stuff, but what good is it if we're not going to do anything with it? What good is it, good is it to go and buy a bunch of stuff and pack it away in closets in the house and, and pack up the garage to where you can't even park in the garage. Got all of this stuff and not doing anything with it. Some of us got a bunch of knowledge. We have a bunch of time that we spend in church and we're not doing anything with it. And God wants us to do something with it. Chapter two in Laurie's book is effective sharing starts with caring. Effective sharing starts with caring. And so if I'm going to be effective in sharing uh, the faith, then I first need to start with caring. Effective sharing starts with a God-given concern for the person with whom you are speaking. May I ask you a question? Be honest. How do you feel about unbelievers? How do you feel? What, what's in your heart about unbelievers? What, what do you feel? What do you sense when you see and you know someone that doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ? How do you feel about that? In 2 Timothy chapter uh, 2, verses 25 through 26, Paul focuses our attention and understanding that people who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ are still in bondage. They have been held captive by the prince and the power of this air and the, and the Lord of this world, which is Satan. They are held captive. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 25 and 26, go in the scriptures and see what it says there. It says, greatly instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. Then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap, for, he, for they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. Can you not see 
when you look around and look at the evil that is happening in this world, that people are being held and controlled by an evil force. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against angels and against principalities, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And our hearts should bleed for people that are so tormented and so broken and so wounded that they would actually think that by going out and hurting somebody else, it's gonna make them feel better. The world needs Jesus. When you look at the violence in places like Jackson, Mississippi, in places like Chicago, Illinois, where they are literally walking up and shooting people in the broad daylight, places like Atlanta, places like Gainesville, Florida, everywhere, people will literally walk up and shoot one another and think nothing of it. That's an evil spirit that's running wild, folks. That's the only thing you can call that. And our hearts should be moved with compassion. And the only way to counteract that is with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's where we should care. We, we should feel personally burdened for non-believers, that our hearts ought to be made to bleed for those that don't believe. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, the Bible says, yet preaching the good news is not something I can boast about, for I am compelled by God to do it. How terrible for me, or as he says in the King James, woe is me if I preach not the good news. Can I tell you this? Jesus cares about people that don't know him as Savior. Oh, yeah, he cares. He cared enough to die on the cross for them. In Luke chapter 15, turn there in your copy of the scriptures. In Luke chapter 15, uh, there's a pericope of parables or a trilogy of parables that Jesus uses to illustrate the importance of the lost. The first comes in, in chapter 15, verses 4 through 7, when he talks about the shepherd that lost one sheep, he has 100 sheep, 99 are safe, but one is lost. And he goes through great pains and strains to find that one. The shepherd of our souls cares about every lost sheep and so should we. Then in verses eight through 10, Luke chapter 15, verse eight through 10, it's the parable of the woman that lost a coin. The coins around her headdress uh, were like her dowry. It was, it was her uh, wedding gift. It was the money that the bride got uh, when she got ready to go out and start a new life with a new husband. She lost one of those coins, which was a symbol of her care and was a symbol of her being married and, and, and being under the, the care of a husband. And so by losing it, uh, it was a shame to her and it was uh, also something that was precious to her because it was given to her for her wedding. And she sweeps the house, lights a lantern and, and sweeps the house until she finds her coin. God has done the same thing. He has given a light, which is the gospel and which is the Lord Jesus Christ himself that John says in John chapter one, the light that lights every man that comes in the world. He's given a light and that light has now been imparted in the local New Testament church. And as long as the church exists in this world, the light is still on. And as long as the Holy Spirit is left in the world, the Holy Spirit is sweeping the house, trying to find those that are lost. But then third, he gives the parable of the father who lost a son in verses 11 through 32. It's the, the parable that we call the, the prodigal son. But really the son is not the focal point of the parable. It's actually the father uh, that is the most important character in the story because the son, two sons, both of them are in bad spiritual positions and cases. The son who stayed had a spirit of jealousy and a spirit of, uh, of superiority and arrogance. The son that left had a spirit of rebellion, but the father stands in the gap between the two of them having nothing but love and compassion. And when the son that strayed away comes back home, the father runs to meet him because he loves him so much, kisses him and keeps on kissing him calls for a ring to be put on his finger, calls for a cloak to be put on him to cover up the stench and the filth of the life that he's been in, calls for a calf to be slain to celebrate just as God celebrates when one person comes to, to the sa salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. God loves us and he cares about each of us and God loves and cares about those that are lost. And so friend, just as God cares, you and I should care. Just as God is moved with compassion, you and I are moved with compassion. Do you really care about those that have lost a father cared enough to be inconvenienced? 
it was it was it was an inconvenience for him to restore a son that had taken all and wasted it. But he didn't mind to be inconvenienced. Some of us need to be inconvenienced. We're so busy that we don't want to stop what we're doing just to share the gospel. But if we would take the time, but if we would take the time, God could touch those that need to hear his great truth. But not only was the father inconvenienced, the father acted without concern for his own dignity. The father went running. It was, it was for him, a man of that age, it was a shame for a man of that age to be seen running. It was, it was something that a man that age would not do. And why wouldn't he wait for the son to come to him? After all, it was the son that walked away from him, but he goes running out to meet him. Can I tell you something, friend? It was you and I that walked off from God. It was, it was us that sinned against God. It was, it was us that deserved the wages of sin, which is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. But what does God do? He comes pursuing us often and, and consistently pursuing us. We couldn't go and find God. We didn't know the path to get to God. So he came to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. The word of God says in Romans, but God reconciling man back unto himself through Christ Jesus. Can I ask you this? Do you love your son enough to sit down with him and just walk through the Bible and say, this is why I love God. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is why I want you to know him as well, because I love you. Do you love your daughter enough to turn the TV off, to stop the business of your life and say, I want to talk to you about your soul salvation? I want to ask you, do you know Jesus? And if you don't, let me share with you how you can come to know him. Do you love your brother enough to say, hey, man, I love you, but I want to be your brother, not just in the flesh and on earth, but I want to be your brother in the spirit. I want to be your sister in the spirit as well. I want you to know the Christ that I know. Friend, our hearts ought to be moved with compassion to see people saved. Here's one of the greatest threats that I see and one of the greatest tragedies, rather not a threat, but a tragedy I see in local New Testament churches today. We're no longer passionate about seeing people come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And friend, may I share with you that again, our hearts need to bleed. Our hearts need to long for people to know the love of Christ because if people can't love him, they can't love each other. And that's where God is calling us to. You can based on your life, tell someone about the Lord Jesus Christ and share the good news of Jesus. I hope you'll share your faith with someone and do it this week. We'll share with you next week a portal that we have where you can record and log gospel conversations. God bless you. I love you. Share your faith.